All right, this video kind of gives an overview of the four big learning theories, and we will go through each one of those. This is just an overview, but a theory, what the heck is a theory? It's a way to explain a set of facts, and there's different theories that connect and explain different data dots differently. And every theory is a little bit right and a little bit wrong. There's no such thing as the perfect theory. So let's start out with the first one, neurological learning theory. Learning is strengthening neural pathways or creating new neural networks, expanding those existing networks. And we use these networks to make sense of new data. The more expansive our networks are, the better we are able to make sense of new neural networks. Neural networks are formed by individual experiences. So no two people can have the same perception of things. Two pe people perceive things differently. That's why people of good character have different views on religion and politics and learning theories based on their existing neural networks. And there is a two-way flow of information that's important from the cortex down and from the input sense data thalamus up. There is 10 times more information flowing down from the cortex than going up. That shows us that we use what is in our head to make sense of reality out there. That is a major concept. All right, transition to behavioral learning theories. Learning here is a change, a relatively change or permanent change in behavior that occurs as a result of experience. And we're going to look at those four things. Classical conditioning first. If two stimuli occur together frequently enough, they eventually become associated with each other. The result of this association is that each stimulus eventually produces a similar response. So as teachers, we want to create a positive nurturing presence because students associate that school, that classroom, that learning with something positive. Positive emotional experiences can enhance learning. Negative detracts or impedes learning. So to the greatest extent possible, we want to eliminate failure, frustration, and humiliation. But this happens often with children with learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities. They face this traumatic situation of humility, uh, humiliation. And often school becomes related to this same negative situation. Operating condition, the organism is acting upon or operating upon reality, then receives a reward or punishment. Rewards means the action is more likely to be repeated. Punishment more likely to not be repeated. What is of interest here is the pre-MAC principle. More reliable behaviors can be used to reinforce less reliable behaviors. That means find what students like to do and use that to reinforce the behaviors you want to see. Middle school students like talking to each other. When you get done with your homework, then you can talk to each other in the small group. That's an example of the pre-MAC principle. Things they like to do intrinsically. Don't always have to give rewards and presents and prizes and such. Behavioral learning objectives. This again reflects the theory, the behavioral learning theory that learning is a change in behavior that occurs as a result of experience. So learning, according to this theory, should be behaviorally defined. It's a change in behavior. So thus says the behavioralists, lesson plans should have a behavioral objective, which is a single sentence which defines the behavior that we would like to see occurring as a result of learning. You can say yes or no in terms of if the student has achieved that behavioral objective. Students will complete 9 out of 10 correctly on the short A worksheet. Yes, they did. No, they did not. <clears throat> Social cognitive learning theory technically is a behavioral learning theory. Learning here is a change in mental processes that creates the capacity to demonstrate different behaviors that occurs as a result of observing others. 
Mary watches Sam. Mary sees Sam get punished for behavior. Mary avoids that behavior. So we are observing models and seeing the rewards and punishments, thinking that if we act in a similar way, we will get rewarded or punishment. <clears throat> one important idea here is that social interaction enhances learning. That's one uh, implication. So we want to create the structures where conversations occur. The classic study, of course, is the Bandura study where the children observed aggressive adults and tended to react more aggressively. All right, cognitive learning theories. Learning here is a change in cognitive structures that occurs as a result of the experience. Now, a cognitive structure is the organized body of knowledge in, he in our heads. It's like a file cabinet. All right, a series of neural networks, if you were. Schema, singular, schemata, plural, sometimes it's called a scheme. These go by different names. These are the individual file folders in our head, which is a metaphor. You don't really have a file folder, but it's the neural networks related to a specific topic, concept, or thing. These are all contained in the cognitive structure. For example, I have a schema. Related to frogs, all the frog information is organized in my head, uh, and that's called a schema, plural is schemata, however you decide to define it. Piaget says that learning occurs through the process of adaptation, a natural tendency to adjust to one's environment using assimilation and accommodation. Assimilation is new information that corresponds with existing schemata, the file folder, yes, it contains it. I can simply add a little bit more to that frog file folder. Combination is when new information does not fit with our existing schemata. Uh-oh, I don't have a file folder. So we have to either create a new file folder or expand existing ones or completely rearrange our file folder. Vygotsky said that thinking develops from the outside in. We internalize ways of thinking. Social interaction, an example of social interaction and thinking processes occurring on the outside and coming in. The tea talk where we use supportive statement and we have this social interaction. This is an authentic writing and thinking activity. When you have to say, I believe this because of that, 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 that is an example of social interaction cognitive processes happening on the outside and then becoming internalized. An example of social interaction and thinking process again is the inquiry project where we have that lab report that creates structure, that way of thinking that is internalized. The T-talk and the inquiry are, are, are uh, pedagogical processes pedagogical strategies, advanced pedagogical strategies that enhance learning, but also demonstrate so significantly this Vygotskyan idea that thinking occurs at the social level first, and then ways of thinking cognitive operations are internalized. Vygotsky came up with the zone of proximal development. This is uh, uh, exemplified in the skills lesson plan. Zone of proximal development is just a little above Below the independent level, below the frustration level, where we can complete a task with a scaffold or a structure of some sort. We can do it with teacher help, not heal, or scaffold. The skills lesson plan, of course, we have guided practice. Scaffold is a structure that enables us to complete the task. And with the inquiry, we had the lab report to create structure and the data retrieval charts, all ways of creating structure. Vygotsky, the informational process model. This is a model for how the mind acquires and organizes knowledge. We have sense memory or sense register, can hold a lot of information for a short duration. Short-term memory or working memory, seven plus or minus two bits of information for 15 seconds. Long-term memory, almost limited. It's not the storage of information. It is the retrieval of information. And there is interference, sometimes called forgetting, that gets in the way of our retrieving information. There is a two-way flow of information you see going from sense memory to short-term to long-term 
and the other way around. This reflects neurological learning theory, this top-down flow of information. All these theories do have common elements, repeated elements within them. Constructivist learning theory, all part of cognitive learning theories, says learning is an active process that new knowledge and understanding is constructed based on what we already know. We use what's in our head to make sense of information. We heard that back in neurological learning theory. Bruner said that humans are naturally inclined to make sense of the world. We create order out there. Uh, we, we use uh, what's in our head, inductive reasoning, inductive analysis to create categories and concepts. He is known for discovery learning, which is a pedagogical strategy that says you have the experience first and then the input. This is very much reflective of experiential learning as well. Discovery learning, experience first and then instruction, then the input. Osibel, known for meaningful verbal learning, learning that's connected to something versus learnt rote learning, which is just information that doesn't make sense, that's not connected to anything. He is known for expository teaching where you have the input first, you give the information, and then an experience or activity to reinforce the input. And of course, he uh, was known for uh, a structure and concept as well, and he used graphic organizers. You use a graphic organizer up front, which is called an advanced organizer, and a graph, an advanced organizer is simply a graphic organizer shown in advance of the lesson or in advance of the assigned reading. It shows the structure of what is to be learned. And then transformational learning theory. Learning involves a change or some form of growth at the deepest levels. And we're looking, we're going to look at humanistic learning theory common tenets, and holistic learning theory, and then the six essential characteristics. Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, these are the founders of modern humanistic learning theory, positive psychology, which was common, uh, came to kind of a head in the mid-60s and 70s. Learning here is movement towards self-actualization that occurs as a result of instruction or experience. Self-actualization is where you can reach and develop your full potential. The purpose of school is to help develop good decision makers, effective problem solvers, and responsible world citizens who contribute to democratic societies. Such learning and activities creates the dis disposition and abilities where one is better able to be a good decision maker, problem solver, and a responsible world citizen. That is the purpose of education when it is working just right. Three common tenets, of course, humans are evolving, self-developing, always by our very nature, and we have this natural inclination to learn and to fully develop. Hence, thus, therefore, learning is enhanced when we align learning experiences with this natural inclination to develop, to learn, to evolve. So the goal of education, the purpose of schools, is to help and enable each person to develop his or her full potential to self-actualize. That is the purpose of, of schools. Holistic learning theories... Uh, uh, noted, uh, uh, associated with Maria Montessori, Montessori schools, and Rudolf Steiner, Waldorf schools, and uh, modern theorists John Miller and uh, Ron Miller, not related. Learning is, uh, learning here is transformation of consciousness, greater understanding of and care for self, others, and the environment. That's that transformation of consciousness. You understand yourself better and others and the environment. Consciousness here is simply what we are aware of, both internally and externally. So learning is expressed in terms of personal transformation as it relates to an expansion of consciousness. We can transform ourselves and ultimately the world by transforming 
consciousness. Holistic lear learning theory is based on this theory of interconnectedness, which is related to quantum physics and systems theory, based on this idea that everything is connected. We are all connected to each other. Connectedness occurs at the implicit level and the explicit level. All human life, all plant life, we are interconnected. So, six characteristics. Holistic education seeks to develop not just the brain, but the whole person, the emotional, the social, the creative person. Holistic education seeks to develop relationships with students, with teachers, with the community, with people, with the world. Incorporate real life experiences. This is the Bruner idea of disciplined inquiry, where you're going out there and acting like a science. This is experiential learning or service learning in which you try to have <clears throat> experiences in the real world or curriculums are somehow related to or infused with real world experiences. Holistic education enables learners to critically examine and define their own values and views. It is not to give them our values and views, but help them elucidate theirs. And we use activities such as values clarification, where they identify their values, moral dilemmas, and tea talks. Holistic education recognizes the transpersonal element, which is something greater than oneself, outside oneself, however you choose to define it. And again, holistic education recognizes the interconnectedness of all things. And I will be preparing a separate mini lecture, lecture specifically on the application of a holistic learning theory. It seems a little bit smoky, but actually it is quite concrete when you are able to unpack each of these six elements. All right, the big four, neurological learning theory, behavioral learning theories, cognitive learning theories, and transformational learning theory.